So can you please tell me your name at birth? Don Heinemann. Did you have a middle name? Don J. And when was your birthday? 92626. And you're the son of a West by God, Virginia. Tell me about your childhood. Well, my, my uh, father was a Presbyterian preacher and uh, I was born in Kansas, and then he accepted a, uh, a pastorate in New Martinsville, West Virginia, and the Presbyterian Church there, and moved there when I was six months old. I was an only child. What else do you want to know? Uh, what was his name? His name was Don, Don Heinemann. And what was it like growing up the son of a preacher? Uh, it was it was it was kind of lonesome, I suppose, being an only child. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, my dad uh, became friendly some way or another with the governor of West Virginia, and he was appointed chaplain and welfare director of West Virginia Penitentiary, which was in Moundsville, which was 20 miles from the little town that, uh, that uh, I grew up. And uh, so he kind of commuted to Moundsville. He had an office uh, in the penitentiary, and I'd go up there to visit him or he'd come home. Uh, and he got the idea of, of uh, the Pen Review. He figured that with 5,000 inmates uh, in the penitentiary that, that uh, there was talent. So, so he got dancers and singers and, and he formed an orchestra as well. And I, I learned to play the sax and the clarinet because my mother was a concert pianist and she wanted me to play piano and I never would but I did learn to play a clarinet. At any rate, I went up to um, Moundsville and, uh, and, and sat in the prison dance band. And uh, there were five saxes, four trumpets, four trombones, bass, pan, and drums. And um, so next to me was a black guy playing sax. And I said, Willie, why are you in the penitentiary? And he said, murder, kid. So I, that was quite an experience in, in uh, growing up, playing in the prison dance band. Then I played in a band in high school. So that, uh, I played sax and clarinet. And how did your father become a minister? I can't answer that, I don't know. But he was a minister and he met my mother at a, uh, at a, uh, uh, a retreat somewhere in Indiana. She was quite religious, and they married. What was her name? Her name was Leela. What was her maiden name? Leela Miller. And tell me about your parents. What were they like? Were they strict? Were they funny, loving? Very normal. My mother was uh, probably more, more strict than my father. And, uh, but uh, I think I had a very normal childhood. Um, but what kind of personalities did they have? You said she was a little bit st stronger. Tell me about their personality. Well, my mother played the piano. She played the <clears throat> piano for church. Uh, my father was a great speaker. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was a good friend of... Uh, of uh, not Billy Graham, but uh, it was another evangelist, and and my father was a uh, good speaker. I remember my memory of being in in church would be that if the I was sit I'd sit in the back of the church, and this was in grade school and high school, and and if he if he talked too long, I'd take off my watch and <laughs> hold it up and get him to cut down on, you know. But uh, then he passed away when I 
just got out of the army, <clears throat> which is in about 1945 or 1946. And what, what did he pass away from? He had a heart attack. And so you had just gotten out of the army? Yeah. And what was that like for your mother? Did she remarry? No. She never remarried. Um, and of course, I was, and then I went to college. I was at Indiana University, and she was always there in, in, in New Martinsville. She passed away in New Martinsville. How old was she when she passed away? She was 92 or 3. My father passed away, however, when he was about 65. So that was a lot of years she was alone and you were the only child and you were off at college. Do you know what that was like for her? Yeah, well, she, she was very active in the church, uh, very active in organizations. Uh, she was very well known. It was a small town. Everybody, everybody knew everybody. And how do you think she influenced you? Well, when I got out of the service, I, I enlisted in the Air Force. And um, the Air Force, when I was 17 years old, this would be in 1944, uh, when I graduated from high school, the Air Force sent me to the University of Dayton in a pre-aviation cadet program. And... Um, then they didn't take me into active service until I was 18 and a half. So I went um, a, a half a year to the University of Dayton, got out of the University of Dayton, and my mother said, you're going to Indiana University. So I went to Indiana and uh, pledged beta, was not initiated, was called into service and went into the Air Force when I was 18 and a half. And I was sent to, to uh, Amarillo, Texas. Uh, they washed out anybody that was supposed to be a pilot or a navigator because the war was over. And uh, they said, you can either be a uh, uh, a, a mechanics gunner on a B-29, or you can be a radio gunner. And I said, well, I want to be a radio gunner. So they made me a mechanics gunner and sent me to school in Amarillo, Texas. But I got in a band in Amarillo, Texas, and I was making $20 a night playing in the band, and I paid somebody to go to school for me. Yeah and uh, paid them $10 and I made $10. And I told, and then I was assigned to a B-29 crew and I told the captain of the B-29, I'm going to get us all killed because I know nothing about a B-29. I didn't even go to class. I didn't learn about the electrical system or the hydraulic system. And he said, that's okay. He said, all you have to do is to change the tires and wash down the B-29. I said, I can do that. So I was washing down the, the, the plane one day and a warrant officer came out, he yelled my name and he said, I see it's you service records, you play a sax and clarinet. I said, yeah. He said, do you want to get into a band? I said, anything to get off this damn B-29. So he took me over to a barracks, gave me a, a new alto sax, and a new clarinet, and I sat in the band. Now this was attached to the USO, but an Air Force band. It was a 746th AAF band. And so I sat there, and the tune that they were rehearsing as a band, I'll never forget, was All of Me, if you know that tune. Mm -hmm. So. I wet the reed on the sax and we played all of me. The lead sax was to my right, a guy by the name of Sandy Noller. And after we finished all of me, he looked at me and he said, you're horrible. <laughs> and I said, well, apparently I'm all you can get. And he said, yeah, you are. He said, but I'll teach you. He said, we'll, we'll meet here every morning at eight o'clock 
because our rehearsals are at 10. So he taught me scales and he taught me to read. I got pretty good. I never could solo because I didn't know chords, but I learned to read. So I played, I played in a band for, for uh, uh, a year and a half. And then I was, went to Manila and Tokyo. And then I was, uh, I was uh, uh, and then I went out, was discharged from a service in Seattle, went back to West Virginia. And uh, my mother said, well, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, mother, I said, our band that we were, that we had, has decided that we'll meet in 30 days in New York, and we'll be the band for Claude Thornhill and his orchestra, because Claude Thornhill played piano. And uh, she said, you're not going to New York. You're going back to Indiana University. So I did. I called the guys and I said, hey, I, I'm not going to be in the band. I'm going to Indiana. So then I went back to Indiana University, lived in the Beta House, graduated in 1949. And so did you ever end up in the Claude Thornhill Orchestra? Pardon? Did you ever end up in the Claude Thornhill Orchestra? No, I, my mother said I couldn't. She said I had to go back to IU. And why was your nickname Killer in college? <laughs> I got that nickname in actually in high school because I, well, one thing that I did from age 13, since my, my father was a minister, we didn't have any money. And so I worked and I had jobs. And one of my jobs was um, I worked at Weiner's department store and um, would replace the shoe boxes and sweep out the store. And then I worked at the Elm Tree Inn, which was owned by a teacher by the name of Helen Piles. And, um, and uh, she, we had a, a problem with flies. And so I got a fly swatter and I killed flies and she started calling me killer. <laughs> that's, where I, that's where I got the name. Um, going back to your father and mother, were they born in the United States? Yes. Where were they born? Well, my father was born in, in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, and uh, my mother was born in Warren, Indiana. And did your mother work? No. And did your father have other jobs before he became a minister? Not that I know of. So the only thing you know about your father was that he was a minister? Yeah. But my mother's family, I knew uh, very, very well. And what were your mother's parents' names? Uh, Emerson Miller. E they called him E.P. Miller. And uh, they lived in a little town in, in, uh, near Bluffton, Indiana, called Warren, Indiana. And uh, he was a very wealthy guy. He, he uh, had a hardware store. He owned the bank. And um, so my mother grew up in a, a pretty, pretty wealthy family. And when did you first meet your wife? Um, she was a Delta Gamma at, uh, at Indiana. And her Delta Gamma grandmother was a gal by the name of Ann Cravens. And... Uh, and Ann Cravens was from Toledo, Ohio, and we were very serious, and I gave her a ring, and we were planning to be married eventually. And um, she, the, the summer after I had graduated, she called, she was in Toledo, and I was in, in uh, Indianapolis, and she called and she said, you know, I'm in Toledo, you're you're in uh, you're in Indianapolis, working. She said, "You should take Ann Cravens, or uh, Ann, uh, not Ann Cravens. You should take um, a Pat Bray DeForest out to dinner." 
since I'm not around. So I took uh, I took Pat out to dinner, and I said, "Uh oh," <laughs> and I uh, ended up. I don't know whether I got the ring back or not, but I ended that. We ended that deal, and Pat and I started to date. Now, do you think she was telling you to take her out because she knew her and she was just lonely, or do you think she was telling you, "I, I think we should break up"? No, she, 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 she just thought it'd be nice, right? Because. They were good friends. Did they remain good friends after you switched? I don't know. <laughs> um, so what first attracted you when you met Pat? Well, she's a good-looking gal. And um, um, we, we had a lot in common. And uh, she was four years, five years younger than I. And so I pulled her out of college and... We got married in Indianapolis, and... Um, All right, well, wait, let's back up for a second. You said you started dating. Where would you go on dates? Do you remember your first date? Um, I really don't. So where were some of the places you would go on dates? Oh, we'd go out for dinner. I don't know. I don't remember where. And how long did you date? Well, first of all, how far apart did you live? Well, how far apart? Uh, I, I, I was in an apartment, and she lived at home. And um, so we dated, and then we... Well, like how far did you have to drive to her to pick her up? Well, yeah, but Indianapolis is not that big. And did you own a car? Yeah. Do you remember what kind of car? Yeah, I had a Chevy that my uncle gave me. You know what year it was? No, I don't. <laughs> um, so you would pick her up and you would go out? Yeah. And then how long did you go out for before you got engaged? I don't remember. Probably six months. And do you remember how you asked her to get married? No. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. <laughs> and when did you get married? Uh, well, we got married in 1951. Do you know the date? Yeah, um, May 5th. And where did you get married? At the, um, at the um, Methodist Church in Indianapolis. And did you have a big party afterwards? Yeah, my, uh, my, uh, my ushers were all my college uh, fraternity brothers. And... Um, and Pat's bridesmaids were her sorority sisters, and we were married. And Dr. Robert Pierce married us in Indianapolis. And then, lo and behold, some years later, Dr. Pierce was transferred to Chicago from Indianapolis, and he was made the minister of the First Church downtown Chicago. Huh. So we, after we were married and had children, Dr. Pierce was was in downtown Chicago. We used to go downtown to church from Hinsdale because Dr. Pierce was had married us and was, was a minister there. And how long have you been married? Um... I jokingly say, been married to my current wife for 71 years. Wow. And what do you think the secret is to a long marriage? Because most people aren't married 71 years. Um, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> right after I graduated from Indiana, I interviewed several companies and... Um, went to work in Indianapolis with a company called Inland Container Corporation, mm -hmm. which was a very large manufacturer of corrugated boxes. They put me in a training program, a two-year training program in Indianapolis. I finished that training program, and we were married during that period, and then I was transferred by Inland Container 
to Chicago. That's how Pat and I got to Chicago. And so I was a salesman for Inland Container in Chicago, and we got an apartment at 5038 West Washington Street in Chicago, a third floor walk up. I was making a hundred bucks a week. Do you remember how much that apartment was? $65 and I was lucky to get it. 65 a month. 65 a month because the owner of the apartment was a guy by the name of Ken James and he was a friend of, of my sales manager whose name was Art Thursby. So I, we lived in that apartment and Jeff was born uh, our oldest was born while we were in that apartment. And did you have a refrigerator in that apartment? Yeah. So not an ice box. You had a refrigerator? I think we had a refrigerator. I don't remember. Did you have your next child? We built a house. We, we came out to Hinsdale uh, to see um, Pat's relative who was Aunt Grace Veck, Bill Veck's mother. And... Uh, we liked Hinsdale because it was small and um, they didn't have the toll road in those days, for example. It was just a small town. So we built a house at 8th, 8th and Clay for $19,000. How big of a house? How many bedrooms? I think we had three bedrooms. And then... Children, and Jeff, Jeff had been born, then Lacey, then, then um, the rest of the children were, were born. And then we moved from that house to 735 South County Line Road, and we were there in Hinsdale for, um, for 25 years. What did you pay for that house? Um... Paid um, uh, sixty-five thousand at seven thirty-five South County Line Road. Paid sixty-five thousand. We lived there for twenty-five years. Uh, then we built a house at in uh, right south of Oak Brook, which was still in Hinsdale, on. Uh, uh, Fullersburg, which is right north of Ogden Avenue. And we lived there for eight years. And then we moved to the Burr Ridge Club, which is near here. And we lived in the Burr Ridge Club for several years. Then, then we moved here to uh, the woods of KB. And so tell me, and then tell me your jobs right right after college. Well, as I said, I started with Inland Container as and a trainee. Right. They transferred me to Chicago. Right. Um, I was a salesman. I built a territory selling corrugated boxes. I was doing, I'll never forget, I was doing $15 million a year in sales and my boss uh, was a guy by the name of Charlie Moyer and he was 65 years old and uh, I was made I was made sales manager and I went to Charlie Moyer and I said Charlie I'm sales manager you're vice president of sales you're paying me 25000 a year. I've got th three children with one on the way, and I think that you should give me an increase in pay because I'm doing $15 million and my salesman, each of them doing a million. You know, he, he said, well, Don, he said, I can't give you an increase. And I said, why? And he said, it isn't in the budgets. And I said, Charlie... I better start my own damn business. And he said, oh no, don't do that. Because he was 65 and he was about to retire. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay. 
So I decided then to start the company, but I couldn't leave. I So I left that company and went, I became sales manager for Packaging Corporation of America. And then I left, I left Packaging Corporation of America and started Time Container. And so when, what year did you start Time Container? 1957. And did, it, did you have to invest money to start it? I borrowed $10,000 from my mother and uh, Bob Hamilton of Hinsdale was president of the Livestock National Bank and he loaned me $30,000 with equipment as collateral. I rented, I rented 20,000 square feet of space from Dave Risley of the Risley Soap Company, which was a customer. And, uh, and there's the sign. My first sign is right there. Uh, we had 20,000 square feet. I hired a production manager by the name of Ed Paisia, who was a wonderful Polish guy that that couldn't speak good English, but he could he could uh, take apart any machine. And then I hired hired um, Howard Jones, who is a good friend even today, uh, to run the inside, and I was a salesman. And um, we manufactured corrugated boxes, and I, I, the, I took my business, I took half of the business with me. So I started the business with seven and a half million in sales. So they didn't, you didn't have to sign any non-compete with them or anything? No, no. Okay, so you, you weren't just selling, you were manufacturing the boxes. Right. So you took half those clients. Who were some of the big clients you had? Well, uh, Risley Soap was a big customer. Then they later went out of business. Uh, but I had just a blue chip list of customers. And uh, uh, in one of the first things that I did was I joined YPO, uh, Young President's Organization. And uh, back here is a, you'll, you'll see the, Mm -hmm. YPO, and one of the first meetings seated next to me was a guy that I didn't know, uh, a member of YPO, and he said, oh, you're a new YPO? I said, yeah. He said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I have a little box company. He said, well, we use a lot of boxes. Why don't you come and see me? And I said, great. Happened to be Bob Galvin, who owned Motorola. So that Monday, I went to Motorola. Bob Galvin called in his president and said, I want Don Heinemann to get some box business. And uh, the president was not happy about it. But they gave me $4 million worth of business. And that was a that, thanks to YPO, right. you know. So, uh, start making money. Uh, interestingly enough, when I started the company, Bob Hamilton loaned me the ten thousand dollars or the thirty thousand on equipment as collateral. My mother had loaned me ten thousand. I ran out of money. I went to Bob Hamilton and I said, "Bob, I need more money. Sales are growing like crazy." He said, "Let me." Let me see your financial statements. I said, oh, I haven't had time to get financial statements. He said, you don't have any, you don't know whether you're making money or not. I said, well, I'm sure we'll, you know, sales are, he said, he said, you got to hire a CPA. So I hired Maury Polanski. And Maury came in and gave me a statement. And he said, Mr. Heinemann, you're out of business. You're damp you're bankrupt. And I said, My sales are increasing every month. He said, You're bankrupt. So I went to Bob Hamilton to bank and I said, Bob, I need more money. I said, Here are the statements. I'm losing money. He said, Well, 
you don't deserve to, to, to get any money, but he said, you sign personally, I'll take your receivables and inventory as collateral, and I'll loan you money on inventory. You know. So, and he said, the stipulation is, you have to call me every night at five o'clock and tell me what you did that day, because he said, you got to run the business, quit selling. So I turned it around and uh, started making money. Then I started another sheet plant, box plant, in, um, in Indianapolis and, no, Frankfurt, Indiana, and acquired several companies, uh, changed the name to Time Industries, went public February the 3rd, 1970 which I'll never forget, went public through William Blair. So tell me about that. Well, uh, I made a lot of acquisitions uh, other, because other, Bob Hamilton... Other box huh? companies? Pardon? Other box companies? Yeah, but I diversified, and um, we were making, making money, and uh, Boise Cascade uh, came to me, a guy by the name of Bob Hansberger, and this was through YPO, basically. And he said, I'd like to buy you out. And I said, well, we're not for sale. But he, I said, do you have anything that you want to spin off? And he said, yeah, we've got a buck, we've got a paper mill in Monroe, Michigan, called Monroe Paper Products, which we only own 60% of. And we, we haven't been able to get the rest of it. And uh, so he said, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd sell you that. Well, I had to get, I said, how much money have I got to get? And he said, you got to get $6 million. So the question of how I was going to get $6 million. So I had uh, gone to Aspen to ski with Ralph Boodleman and Bill Sexton from Hinsdale. And we stayed at the Aspen Inn, and uh, Don Crop was was with us as well. And uh, and as we checked in, Don Crop looked across the, the lobby and said, "Jack Kamek said I haven't seen you since we were at Purdue." He said, "What are you doing here?" And Kamek says, "Well, I own the Aspen Inn. What are you doing here?" And we said, "Well, we're out here to ski and." we're thinking about buying an apartment together. And he said, why don't you buy the Aspen Inn from me? And we said, well, why do you want to sell it? And he said, well, the doctors have given me six months to live. I've got, I've got uh, leukemia, I've got cancer. And uh, so we, we said, what do you want? $350,000. So we went to the Bank of Aspen Borrowed three hundred fifty thousand. Our group signed our name. Now we own the Aspen Inn, and uh, <laughs> and it didn't. It never. It didn't make money. It was. It was losing its shirt. So um, Ralph Buderman was one of the guys, and I said, Ralph, how can I get six million bucks? I got to buy a paper mill. He said, well, you know Fred Regnery in Hinsdale. He belongs to the golf club, and he's, he's chairman of the Central National Bank. I'll introduce you. He said, come out on Saturday. We play gin rummy together. So I go out there. I was about 35 years old or something, and, and he was 60 or something. And uh, I said, I'd like to buy a paper mill. Here are the financials. and whatever. He says, come down to the bank on Monday. We'll loan you the money. So he loaned me six million bucks. I exercised the option with Boise, bought the paper mill, did a tender offer for, for all the, sh the shareholders. It was quasi-public. And um, so that was a big increase in sales. And uh, so then we got it profitable, making money, we had a good, uh, a good story. Went to Ned Janata, who was at the time 
uh, head of finance at William Blair, and he took us public, and and a with with part of the proceeds from the public offering, I got six million dollars and paid off the bank. So that worked out well. And is it still a publicly traded company? No. Um, time time container. Uh, one of the acquisitions that I made uh, was a story in itself in that that um, one of our customers was Hanson Scale Company. And um, uh, Hanson had had started a, a, a manufacturing operation in, in, in Ireland uh, to make scales for the European market. And he called me uh, and said, I can't, can't get corrugated boxes in Ireland. It so happened that there was only one manufacturer of corrugated boxes in the Republic of Ireland. The name of the company was Jefferson Smurfett. However, there was a box company in Belfast in the northern part of Ireland. So I said, okay. So Hanson said, I'll give you all of, all of the box business. So I, I shipped machinery over to, to Dublin, bought a printer slaughter in Paris, had that shipped in, and started a plant in, in Ireland. When I, was cons when I was working on putting the, the thing together, I had a telephone call from Michael Smurfett. And he said, we're going to have dinner. And I said, okay. He said, you're not going to start a box plant in Ireland. I said, yeah. He said, oh, you're going to take my Hanson scale business. And I said, yeah. He said, if you start a plant in Ireland, he said, I'll see to it that you're bankrupt in six months. And I said, well, but I had already committed. So I, so I got everything put together. I was spending most of my time in Ireland in those days. I'd come back after a couple of weeks commuting. And uh, so uh, I had to get paper to manufacture the corrugated boxes. So I go to Belfast and said, I'm ready to get a shipment of paper. And they said, we can't sell you. Michael Smurfett had gotten to them. They didn't have a Robertson Patman Act, you know. So Michael Smurfett said, you're not going to sell Heinemann paper. So now I've got a, I've got a box plant full of equipment. I'm running it because I'm there and I have no raw materials. So I get on an airplane, fly over to London and get in a hotel and look at the yellow pages and, and found a company called Allied Paper who agreed to sell me paper in Dublin. But there was a $50 a ton increase for freight. But I had to get it. So I shipped paper over I was manufacturing boxes for Hanson Scale and hired a salesman and started to build build that. And uh, and um, Michael Smurfett was not very happy. But every time I'd go over there, and incidentally, my wife said, you get somebody to run that thing in Ireland or I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? So I had a, I had a manager but every time I'd go over there, uh, Michael Smurfett would know he must have had a plant at the airport or something because he'd call me at my hotel and say, we're going to have dinner. So he finally, about the second time he, we had dinner, he said, hey, you took my Hanson Scale Company. I'll sell you paper. I'd been losing $50,000 a month. The first month I remember, I lost 50000 bucks. I got P&L statement. But then when Smurfett, when Smurfett, I was saving $50 a ton in, right. in freight, so it started making money. And finally, Michael Smurfett said, I want to buy you out. 
So I said, well, you want to buy me out in Ireland? He said, no, I want to buy the whole company. I said, well, we're public. He said, I'll do a tender offer, buy out everybody except you. And he said, I'll buy you out, but I'll pay you over six years. And I said, fine. So I sold out to him, but I said, Michael, no way can I work for you. I can't work for anybody. He said, that's okay. He said, you just stay on our board of directors and uh, do what you want to do. So I stayed on his board. I was on his board for 15 years. And, uh, and um, he became a good friend. You know, he, he was a great guy. And I was instrumental in him acquiring Container Corporation of America and also in his, his uh, acquiring Stone Container. It became Smurfit Stone. And uh, so uh, Michael, and, Michael and I are still good friends. So your son said you made some crazy investments in your day. Tell me about the J.S. Rixton and Monty Fosnott. Well, uh, that, that's this. Um, one of my directors was a guy by the name of Gene Turner from Indianapolis. And he called me and he said, he said, you, you got to buy my horse. And I said, what, what do I know about a horse? And he said, well, why do you want to sell your horse? He said, I've run out of depreciation. So I bought his, I bought the horse. And, what uh, was the name of the horse? Uh, you named it. J.S. Rixton and Monty Fosno, Fosno? Yeah. Well, Monty Fosnack was my trainer. And uh, he ended up buying the horse from me. The horse never made money. But... Um, so how long did you own the horse? Oh, about probably six months to a year. And you raced him? It was... Uh, it was a uh, uh, a race horse or a show horse. It was it was a ra race horse. Right. Yeah. And where was the horse? Well, the the trainer took care of it. I I didn't have I didn't I wasn't active at all in the thing. <laughs> so why did you do it? Because Gene Turner wanted me to. <laughs> uh -huh. Any other crazy investments that you remember? Yeah, Don Crop uh, was a good friend, and he was one of our guys in the Aspen Inn, lived in Hinsdale. And he said, you know, we ought to do some deals together. And I said, Cropo, anything you want to do, count me in. So about a month later, he called me, and he says, Don, he said, We've just bought 200 head of cattle. And I said, what the hell are we going to do with cattle? He said, I said, how much? I said, how much? And what are we going to do with the cattle? He said, my father's farm and $200,000. And I said, where are we going to get $200,000? He said, from your bank. <laughs> so I go to Bob Hamilton at the Livestock National Bank. And I said, Bob, Don Crop and I just bought 200 head of cattle. I got to borrow 200,000 bucks. The, the cattle are collateral. So he said, okay, you and Crop have to sign personally. I take the cattle as collateral. Fine. So we bought the, we bought the cattle. So we, we, we put the cattle on Don Crop's father farm up in Libertyville. And I had nothing to do with it. Crop would go up there and see that everything was going okay. And he called me and he says, Don, he said, I've got bad news. One of your cows died. <laughs> I said, one of my cows? I said, we're in this together, you know. How do you sh he said, well, my cow wouldn't die, <laughs> you know. So... 
the the trick was we were the, the the cattle were to graze up there all summer then at the end of the season we're to sell the cattle and the profit that we make would be because the cows had grazed and had gained weight however the problem was that the market was down and the cattle weighed less and because and I go to Bob Hamilton and I said, Bob, got a problem. Need more money. He said, what were you feeding the cows? <laughs> I said, what were they were eating? They were grazing. He said, you didn't give them a supplement? I said, we didn't know you were supposed to. <laughs> he, said, he said, I don't know what to tell you. So he said, you got to sell the cows and pay me back. So I called Gene Turner in Indianapolis because he had Stark and Wetzel, which was a meat packer, and he bought the cows. But we lost our shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you end up getting into YPO? Um, I knew some YPOers that were president of a company. The deal is, you got to be president of a company uh, that's doing a minimum, I think it's like 50 million a year with, no, 5 million a year with with 50 employees. And I qualified. And uh, I don't know, I don't know who sponsored me, but um, there are quite a few white viewers around here in Stale and I got friendly with. Um, what effect did YPO have on your business? Fantastic. The uh, the networking, uh, the contacts, the friendships. If you ran into a problem, you 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 can call somebody that's been there, done that. You know, fantastic organization. Are you still a member? They throw you out at age fifty, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and you go into you go from YPO into into CPO, which is Chicago Presidents. And are you still in that for the old guys? Are you still in that? No, I'm Florida. Tell me about your thoughts about free enterprise. I'm strictly a capitalist, I'm strictly free enterprise guy. I think it, uh, I don't think you want me to get started on Biden. <laughs> Tell me whatever you want. I'm here to interview you. Tell me your thoughts about free enterprise. Well, capitalism and free enterprise is what has made the United States of America what it is. I mean, where else in the world can you have absolutely nothing and start a business and through hard work, do pretty well in your life, you know. And that's American free enterprise. Um, as you think about your legacy, what do you want people to remember you for? Just remember me. <laughs> well, how do you think your grandchildren will remember you? Well, I, I haven't been Unfortunately, they've they've lived they've lived elsewhere, and I really haven't been able to spend as much time as I'd like with them. Uh, I'm very proud of them. Uh, they've done well. Uh, one of my grandchildren was just here this last weekend. Uh, we have a good relationship. Uh, particularly with uh, with with the California daughter's adopted daughter, who is my grandchild, who we're very close, we're very close, we're email. And as I, I mentioned at lunch, uh, she's um, at the University of California in pre med. There are we have a grandson by the name of Austin. Who is Jeff's son? That uh, is uh, 
in triathlon. He's training for the Olympics. Got to be proud of him. You know, he got a free ride to college and he trains for the Olympics. <clears throat> Pardon me, triathlon, bicycling, uh, track, and you know, so he's, he's fantastic. Um, what do you think has made you a good businessman? I think I've hired good people. Uh, and I've had great cooperation from, from the banks. I've always been highly leveraged. Uh, I've always borrowed money to make acquisitions. And, um, and I've, I've had the cooperation from, particularly from the Continental Bank over the years. But I'm going back now because, you know, I, I mean, I, I've been retired for what, 10, 15 years, you know. But uh, uh, I, hired, I hired real good people, by and large. What was your best business decision you ever made? Probably selling out to Michael Smurfett. What was the worst business decision you made? Uh, probably, probably uh, making Clark Food Service too leveraged, too much debt. Do you believe in God? Of course. So let's say you meet him someday. What do you think he'll say to you? Why didn't you go to church more? <laughs> um, is there any message to your grandchildren and beyond on how to live a life? No, I, I, I'd say, you know, develop good friendships, uh, uh, be tolerant in, in your marital life, uh, and uh, and try to give back.